The Word of God I'd like to lay on your heart this morning is the Gospel appointed for today, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 50. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm, or perhaps better translation we maggot, does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is God's Word. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my dear friends in Christ. Jesus probably kind of thought so too. 
And so it's interesting the response that Jesus gave. But of course the response isn't quite so easy for me to understand. I'm assuming you don't quite see the response or the, the masterful response that it truly is. John tells Jesus, we saw this guy casting out demons. He wasn't in our fellowship, so we tried to stop him. It might sound a little childish at first, but if you go back to the beginning of this chapter, right after the transfiguration, the disciples are presented with a, a young boy with epilepsy. Actually, the Bible says he had a demon. And the disciples tried to cast out this demon, but were not able to. Then Jesus comes along. Why, why couldn't we cast out the unbelieving generation? Sometimes it only come out with prayer. And Jesus, of course, casts out the demon. So the disciples are already feeling a little bit inferior. And now they find somebody who's not in the twelve doing something which they weren't able to do in that circumstance. Jesus did give them authority to cast out demons when he sent out the 72, and they were able to do that, just not in this case. And so now they see somebody doing what they couldn't do, but not one of us, so they try to stop him. And Jesus, first of all, tells them, don't stop him. That's not your place. He says in Mark, Almost the opposite of the way Matthew reports it, but they both say the same thing. Matthew says, if he's not with us, he's against us. Mark says, if he's not against us, he's with us. The point for both of them is there's no middle ground with Jesus, no neutrality. Either you're with him or you're again. And if you're not again, you're with him. Not their place to stop him. But then, Jesus brings it about to an interesting twist. First of all, he says, I tell you the truth, giving even a cup of cold water to one little once won't lose your reward. People think of great ideas of what awesome ministry ought to be like. Jesus says it's not always so public and so noticeable. God is pleased with the little minor things that nobody notices. But then Jesus twists it from Rather than you watching and trying to stop, maybe you should watch and try to stop yourself. Your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Your right foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Is Jesus serious about that? A lot of people think that perhaps he's speaking metaphorically. I think Jesus was deadly serious. Let me put it this way. Let's say that you get an infection and the doctor finds out that there's gangrene in there. He says, we got to amputate. Is he serious? I know somebody who was a diabetic. She got an infection on her toe. It turned gangrenous. And so they cut off the toe. But guess what? They didn't get all of the infection. So they had to cut off half of her foot. But guess what? They still didn't get all the infection. So they cut off all of her foot. But guess what? They still didn't get all the infection. So they cut off her leg at the knee. But guess what? They still didn't get all the infection. So they cut off her leg at the hip. And guess what? They finally got all the infection. And when I last saw this lady, she was in bed, stumped right there, because she got an infection in her toe. 
Gangrene will kill you. And the only cure is amputation. As scary and horrible as gangrene is, what about sin? Sin won't kill you physically. Well, yeah, it will. But much more deadly, it will kill you spiritually. Sin causes separation from God. Sin deserves hellfire. And if we're serious about gang green, shouldn't we be even more serious about sin? Jesus is deadly serious when he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It would be better for you to go into heaven without a hand than with both hands to go to hell. Or both feet. Or both eyes. So are you sinners ready to line up and start amputating? Let's be honest. Let's say that we were to cut off our hands. And our feet. And our eyes. Would that stop sin? Would we finally be free of sin if we could get rid of our extremities? Jesus himself says, when people were complaining about eating with unwashed hands, he says, it's nothing that goes into your body that makes you unclean. No, it's what comes out of your heart that makes you unclean. Out of your heart proceed murder, adultery, theft, fornications, and the list goes on. It's out of our heart that is the source of sin. So, of course, all we need is a heart bypass, right? Put an artificial heart in there, and then we're free of sin. Oh, wait. The heart in the Greek and Hebrew is not talking about the pump. It's talking about your emotions, your soul, yourself, your mind. And so no amount of amputating is going to cleanse us of our sin. Which is why Jesus was so earnest in his mission to lose not just hands and feet and eyes but his own life. Jesus was willing to give up everything because he knew that the only thing that can purify sin is death. But he didn't want us to experience eternal death. He would much rather experience death himself. And those who are baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death and resurrection and holiness, freedom from sin. So when the disciples start poking around their noses in other people's business, Jesus says, you turn it around and you poke it in your own business. <coughs> you see that sin is such a huge thing that you have enough to wrestle with your own sins. You don't have to worry about other people's sins. And you cry, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus will forgive. And then he ends with this interesting, everything will be salted with fire. Five words. Yet the Bible Knowledge Commentary says it has been interpreted in 15 different ways. What does Jesus mean? Everything will be salted with fire. And many commentators think that verse 50 and, and 49 have to be two different kinds of salt and two different kinds of fire because it doesn't make sense putting them together. But, if you think of salt as a preservative, Matthew Henry even points out that when you salt a fish, you call it curing it. If you think of salt as the preservative, and the fire is the Holy Spirit working through the Word, then what Jesus says is, rather than sticking your nose in other people's business, you'd be concerned about yourself and make sure that you stick your nose in the book where you hear about your sin and your Savior. 
where you build up your faith so that you are able to keep yourself in check and not worry about others, but encourage others, have mercy on others, and have peace with others. So don't judge other people and try to stop their ministry. But instead, look at yourself and try to stop your sin and make sure you keep your nose in the fire so that you have salt to purify. Good news of sins forgiven. When it comes time to look at our sin, we truly say, quit it. Stop. Don't. But when it comes to other people and the way that they serve, it might not quite mean what we're familiar with, used to, even comfortable with. But let's not be childish as the disciples and as Joshua and tell them to stop. But let's be even more childish. Let's be like young Billy who says, don't stop. Don't quit. For whoever is not against Jesus is for Jesus. Let's just make sure that we ourselves don't stand against him with our sin. But instead, cleansed by sin, we stand with him. Amen. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for men. Yeah.